beginning a new series, uh, as I made reference to last week, entitled The Patterns of Christ, and, and looking at various lifestyle patterns, various characteristics, attributes of, uh, of the life of Jesus Christ, how, how we can apply those in our lives uh, prayerfully, how our life might become more efficient, how our, our lives might become more effective. Uh, more beneficial for the kingdom of God. Uh, following the examples, the patterns uh, that Jesus has already established for us. The, the first of these that we're going to look at, and let me let you know that this series will run all the way into the month of August, I believe to the end of the month of August. It's going to be several weeks long. Uh, but the first one that we're reflecting on this morning, I've just entitled Boldness and Prayer. The reality of prayer and boldness within our, our prayers. Uh, re read the opening scripture with me, Hebrews chapter 4. Let's pick up uh, in the 14th verse. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we have been tempted, yet he was without sin. Verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Father, we just say thank you for your word. God, in the other scriptures that we're going to take moments to reflect in, Father, more than anything, we just want your revelation. God, your truths to be established in our lives. God, and help us to grow in our value of prayer this morning. God, and to be willing to pray with boldness according to your word. Lord, trusting in you, believing in you, simply just having faith in who you are and what you can do. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, have you ever needed the help of somebody close by you with an opportunity or a responsibility that was placed before you? It was an objective that was given to you, but you realized that you could not accomplish it on your own. And so you began to look around you, to seek out those around you, try, trying to find somebody who could partner with you. Or you just realized that the job was too big simply to do by yourself. You needed help from somebody else. I wonder, how, how did you make your appeal for help? How did you ask them to, to help? Let, let me give you some thoughts for just a moment. Ever needed medical attention or medical help? H how did you approach your doctor in that time of needs? With confidence? With assuredness? Or, or, or maybe with a, an attitude of hesitancy? Wonder not, I wonder, can they, can they do the task? Anybody ever had a surgery? better if you go into the surgery believing your doctor can perform the task. It's kind of fearful going into the surgery wondering, I wonder if he can, wonder if he can fix this. And, and, and doctors, they, they, they give you this, this, I think they all give you this, this, uh, we, we do this all the time, it's not that big of a deal. Just relax. Anybody found it hard to relax? It, it may not be a big deal to them, but it sure feels like it's a big deal to me. Last time we talked, you're kind of cutting open parts of me and going to try to rearrange some things. That sounds like a big deal to me. But the doctors, they, they try to instill a, an idea of confidence. Hey, I, we, 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 do the, we can do this with our eyes closed. We've done so many of these. Well, let's just see how it works out. What about if you need a loan? Anybody ever taken out a loan? I wonder how, how do we approach the banker, the loan officer? Uh, hoping we'll get the loan, believing we'll get the loan, wondering if we're credits good enough uh, in order to, to get the loan. On what basis do you make your appeal 
to others for their assistance. How do you approach those that you're wanting to trust in? Do we bargain with them? Do we try to purchase their favor? Do we try to intimidate them to get them to do what we want them to do? But what is your approach? Is there humbleness in your approach because you realize that you need assistance, you, you, you need help, you need energy from, from somebody else. What, what kind of an attitude, let's get back to the message this morning, what, what kind of an attitude do we have when we approach God in our times of need? What, how, how do we pray, how, how do we call out to God in those times of needs? Some, I think we might could identify today, they, they approach God with feelings of unworthiness. Maybe I'm not even qualified to call out to God, to approach God. Because of so, some have what I would classify as great hesitancy, an uneasiness, an unassuredness in approaching God. Some, some we, we like to bargain with God in our times of need. God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. God, if you can help me here, then I'll do more of this over here. Sometimes in those moments of need, we, we, we realize that, or we think that God is some type of a bargaining chip that we can make a deal with. Some I've learned just in their time of despair, just give up. Simply make no appeal or aren't even sure how to make an appeal to God, to ask God for help. The writer of Hebrews, which we've just read right here in Hebrews 4, these uh, three verses that we looked at, tells us to, to practice confident boldness when we come before the throne of grace. Look, look back to verse 16 one more time, the conclusion of this passage. He declares, let us then uh, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This might seem shocking at first glance. Where's the idea of humbleness, humility? Why such boldness when I approach the throne of grace? I wonder how bold are we in our prayers of life? How much assurance is there in our life? How confident are you that God is going to hear you? And if God hears you, how confident are you that God might actually answer your request, your, your prayer, your petition that you have made unto him. The writer says, with boldness, with confidence, approaching God, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. I want to lay before you three thoughts with the idea of boldness and prayer. Number one, I've just identified it as the practice of bold praying. The practice of bold praying. Our, our Lord Jesus was very bold when he was calling out to his Father. Very bold in his times of prayer. He, he was in constant communication, we could say. Continual fellowship with, with the Heavenly Father. And there, there was no friction between his will and God's will. There was always alignments. Even in that, that, that one moment that we captured that, that he was struggling, yet he simply said, Lord, not my will, but God, that your will would be done. Believe it in God's help. Believe it in God's provision. Believe it in God's mercy upon his life. A study of Christian history will reveal that great men and women of God have, have always been bold in their prayer lives. Without hesitancy, they entered into the throne room of the eternal, bringing their praises, petitions, and their expressions of thinks simply believe it in God and believe in what God had the capability to do in their lives. Yet there's others who have practiced bold praying that I believe we can say have been ineffective. Ineffective. Before I get too far, let me caution you that all bold praying is not right. There is some ineffectiveness in both. I, I want us to look into Scripture 
and gain a few revelations from this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. I think I asked you to turn there at the beginning. Luke, Luke chapter 18. I, I just want to give you a couple examples this morning. Luke 18, pick up with me in verse 9. <clears throat> It reads, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. For I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. That's an interesting prayer. Obviously, there's boldness. I mean, think of this for just a moment. Martin, can you help me out for just a moment? Can you come to the altar? Imagine if Martin and I are praying down here at the altar. We're kneeling, but we're old, so we're not going to kneel down right now. It might take us a while to get back up. But imagine we're, especially Martin, he says. <laughs> imagine we're kneeling at the altar, and I can get up because I'm bold. In the temple. God, I just, I want to just say thank you. I'm not like Martin. That I'm not like all those other evildoers. Those, those robbers, those adulterers, everything else. God, I, 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 I'm so glad that I don't behave like he does. I mean, think, if somebody did that in church, we might really need to have pray. Because we might have some other problems going on. Because Martin might get a little bit upset. If I'm, if I'm outward, vocal, in my boldness of praying, God, God thank you for not creating me like Martin. I mean, how crazy does that, Mark, you can take a seat. I mean, that's just, that's what the Pharisee was doing. And then he began to highlight his, what he perceived as his righteousness, his great spiritual achievements of life. Can I say this? Let us avoid prayer like that of the proud Pharisee, who recited complimentary things concerning himself, prideful arrogance, that, that, that's not the type of boldness that I'm referring to today. That, that, that's not the type of boldness that Jesus prayed with. Let, let, let's look into another one. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6 for just a moment. Matthew 6. Pick up with me in the first verse. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Skip down to verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full in full. Secondly, for you this morning, let us avoid the bold praying of the hypocrite who gave himself to public prayer simply to impress others. To impress others. Now let me throw another caution. Jesus is not prohibiting public prayer right here. Some use this and believe he's prohibiting this. Rather, he's simply saying, when we pray in public with the appearance of boldness, we're not praying desiring to impress somebody else. We're not praying trying to put on a performance that we think will get us a greater blessing or a perceived greater blessing because we're puffing ourselves up in our ability to pray in front of others. No, that's not bold praying. Jesus says, don't, don't be like that. There is no reward for that type of prayer. Continue with me in Scripture, verse, verse 6. Verse 6. But when you pray, 
Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secrets will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think there are many words that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Let, let us, number, th number three for you, let, let us avoid the long and persuasive prayers of the pagans who labor under the impression that by beautiful empty phrases and constant repetition, God's reluctance can finally somehow be worn down and that God would answer their prayers. If we pray in God's will, hear me, I don't believe God is reluctant to answer our prayers. Now, once again, God, God's not condemning long prayers. But it all comes back to the heart. Just like a moment ago, God, God's not condemning public prayer. It's what's in the heart. Why, why I'm praying in public. Here, sometimes my prayers might be five seconds Sometimes my prayers can be quite lengthy and just fellowship with God, com communing with God. It's not about the time of the prayer. It's not always about the place of the prayer. It simply is, is my heart right with God? Is my heart pure before God? And am I seeking to pray God's will? Praying in God's will. It begs the question, how, how can I know if I'm praying God's will? I, I'm going to give you the, the most simplest litmus test I can give you. Does it align with Scripture? Am I praying Scripture? Am I praying what God has already spoken? Am I praying what I believe that, that God has put into my heart? That, that, that's how I can identify whether it's God's will or, or it's not God's will. There, there needs to be boldness. We need to practice bold praying, but we have to be careful that our, our boldness is coming from the humility within us, a reverence to God. It, it's not as if God is on a string and He's just going to do what I ask or what I tell God to do. It's, it's learning to pray in the will of God and the purposes of God in my life or possibly into somebody else's life. Second for you this morning, the basis of bold praying basis of bold praying. The, the inspired writer back in Hebrews encourages, encourages us once again to come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because that's the nature of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the patterns of Christ, the, the living, living as Christ himself, the, the, the practices, the patterns that he has already established. It's through Christ that both Jewish and Gentile co converts have access in the presence of our Father God. Ephesians 2 makes this, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. That, that's referring to Jews and also to Gentiles. He goes on to say, Christ as our high priest has entered into the heavens where he has been given a position of sovereignty at the right hand of the Father. It's through Him and in Him that we have the privilege of prayer. Christ, having worn the garments of human flesh and having experienced the trials and tribulations and pressure due to all humanity, is declared to be a very sympathetic high priest. That He identifies with our lives. He identifies with the highs. He identifies with the struggles. He identifies with the pains of life. He's that high priest that sympathizes with us on the basis of his sympathy and his sinlessness we are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace in our time of needs I believe there's many words of encouragement toward being bold in prayer can be found in the teachings of our, our Lord Jesus Christ Let, let's look back to these passages one more time Matthew chapter 6 Jesus made an interesting assumption It's that you would communicate with your Heavenly Father. Look back to Matthew 6, one more time, verse 6. Does it state, if you pray? No, it says, when you pray. Jesus has made a powerful assumption that believers, that followers, that His disciples 
would pray that, that they would be uh, steadfast in their calling out to God. He, he made the, the observation that believers of God would simply pray. But with that in verse 7, I mean chapter 7, if you skip over to it, he, he offers an invitation to prayer. Matthew 7, verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find knock, and the door will be open to you. Verse 8, for everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. An observation that those that asked would also receive. He affirmed that the Father God is generous and good and wise. He illustrated this with the example of the human father responding to the needs of, of his children. Skip down just a few more verses. Pick up in verse 9. It says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven get, get, give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you for this sums up the law and the prophets here Jesus made the assumption that we would pray but also invites us into prayer and reminds us that we serve a good father that he knows the needs of our heart he knows the needs of our lives better than we know for our own children we, we feel like we know what's right. We desire to do what's right for our own children. But how much greater is God in heaven as a father than, than we are? So Jesus simply says, ask. Ask and believe. Ask and trust. Ask with boldness that, that God knows what's right. That God knows what, what's good for your life. The example of Jesus, I, I believe, should encourage us to pray. Our, our Lord made much of prayer in his personal life. Something about his prayer experiences caused his apostles to hunger for that similar experience with God. When they requested his help, he responded by teaching them how, how to pray effectively. Uh, turn back to, to Luke for just a moment. Luke chapter 11. I, I know I'm giving you a lot more than normal, but I want you to see this as we're, we're laying the foundation to the patterns of Christ. Luke, Luke chapter 11, pick up with me in verse 1. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Hmm. Picture this for just a moment with me, church. Here you have the followers, the disciples of Jesus. They just made many observations of his life, watched him. They've now had time with him. And I believe they probably walked up to him and, and said, man, when you pray, things happen. It's like there's an intimate connection between you and God's. How, how does that happen? Teach me. Because I can identify with the disciples. Maybe you can. You ever prayed and it feels like nothing ever happens? Yet you want something to happen. You want to believe that something will happen. It's as if we pray and sometimes even the opposite happens. What's going on? That, that, that's where the disciples were. But here they see Jesus. And when he prays, it's the hand of God moves. When he prays, the, the winds calm down. When he prays, the, the lame get up and walk. When he prays, the, the blind begin to see. When he prays, the, the, the loaves and the fish are multiplied over and, and over. There, there was an effectiveness in the prayer. They, they, they finally, had, in their minds, they, they'd had it. And that's it's what do you know or have that I don't have? Teach it to me. Show it to me. So Jesus begins to 
give them an example. An example of prayer. Let, let's look back to it one more time. Luke, Luke chapter 11. You also find this in Matthew, but we've chosen Luke. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. He simply says, when you pray, just begin to magnify Jesus, magnify God. Exalt Father God for how great he is. How wonderful he is. Establishing him as Lord of your life, supreme within your life. May your kingdom come. See, I believe Jesus was always honoring his Father God, esteeming his Father God. But believing in the progress of his kingdom, salvation of souls, enhancement of the kingdom, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Just a model. It's just a model of right prayer, right praying, effective praying that Jesus, because here the disciples, they have this desire, they, that they're wanting to learn how, how they can have boldness within their prayers. Skip down to verse 13, Luke 11, skip down to verse 13 for just a moment. We read about this in Matthew. If you then, know, though you are evil, know how to give gifts, good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What do we find here? The promise of Jesus concerning the results of prayer should encourage us to be bold in our praying. Jesus made observations concerning the rewards that come from God to those who make it a practice of coming into his presence in their times of need. Je Jesus never promised that God would grant the selfish, petty requests of people who view God as some kind of a, a celestial Santa Claus, but those who are truly trusting, surrendering him, believing in the will of God into their lives, trusting in the will of God into their lives. Knowing that God wants to provide good. That God wants to do good into our lives. I also believe that the nature of the Lord himself, Jesus, should be one of the greatest encouragements for our boldness in prayer. We read about it in Hebrews 4 for the sake of time. Maybe don't turn back there. But he says he's a high priest who identifies with us. He understands, as we've said, he suffers with us in our needs, yet he also is able to help us, to deliver us, to restore us back to that, that place of righteousness with Jesus. Lastly, in this context this morning, Romans 8, 26, let me just give it to you. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We, we often, we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And praying with boldness, we, we need, we're dependent upon the leadership of the Holy Spirit on the basis of practicing boldness within our prayers. That, that indwelling work of the Holy Spirit will not only lead us into the closet of prayer, but he will also help us to pray according to God's will, praying according to God's purposes, at times praying in the spirits in my own life, just trusting in the leading of the Holy Spirit. There's boldness there. There's strength. There's encouragements in praying in boldness in our prayer. Number three for you today. The need for boldness and prayer. Why, why, why do I need boldness and prayer? It's a great thought. I'm not asking you to raise your hand or answer out loud, but just as a self-examination for you, before I get into this, how bold do you feel like your prayers are? On a scale of 1 to 10, some might say an 8 or 9, some might say somewhere right there in the middle, 
some, being honest, might even say a one or two. <laughs> and our boldness of prayer. Can I tell you that there's a need for boldness of prayer? I'm fixing to identify a few reasons why. Oh, I understand there may not be a lot of boldness when you pray over your food. <laughs> but there are critical moments in our life that Jesus identifies that, that we need boldness, confidence, to a, approach that throne of grace with confidence. Each of us, number one, stands in need of mercy and grace from day to day. I don't know about you, I, I need grace. I need mercy. Hebrews chapter 4, look, look back one more time. I, I want you to catch this. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. I, if there's one thing, and I feel like I've learned many things in this life, I, I've come to the realization that I, I need mercy. I, I need grace. So I've got to learn to approach the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness, that I might receive that grace and that mercy that I need. There, there's not hardly a day, number two, when we do not stand in need of the cleansing grace of God concerning our imperfections and our shortcomings. 1 John 1, 9 declares that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This goes back to the model of prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray, and in the middle of that, forgive us of our sins as we forgive others. I'd love to stand before you and tell you I've got it figured out, and I don't make any more mistakes, but I've realized I still do. There's still a lot of imperfections that I realize that God is yet working in my life. I need His grace. I, I need His mercy. I, I need His cleansing over my lives. All children of God need the constant cleansing that comes as a result of a genuine confession so they can enjoy an, an, an unhindered fellowship with God and maintain proper fellowship with others. A boldness, believing that God can cleanse me from my imperfections. That His grace is more than enough. That His mercy is good enough for my life. A belief that, that through the blood of Jesus, that I can be cleansed of all unrighteousness. I need that. I need that, and I know that God is faithful with that. That's a need for boldness in prayer. Uh, number two for you. There's a real enemy out there. I believe our real enemy should cause us to stay close to God. James 4, 7 through 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. We have to resist the enemy. I, I, I don't know about you. Anybody ever been in a difficult situation in life? I don't know, but I, I've learned this. Hey, would you stop hitting me? That doesn't really work. Hey, would you please stop hitting me? They're probably going to keep waylaying on you. Well, here's a weakling. <laughs> We're just going to work this one over. A boldness. How, how come do I have that boldness? Because I've remained near to God. I know in the power, in the authority of Jesus Christ. 
There's going to be boldness in wanting to resist somebody. There, there, there's going to be a boldness in, in resisting to the point that somebody would want to flee, that somebody would want to turn and run the other way. A confidence. Why, why do I have that confidence? Because I'm continuously in the presence of God. I'm continually at the throne of God, that throne of grace, receiving that grace and that mercy that I, I realize that through the power of Jesus Christ that I, I can resist with boldness, with authority, resist the enemy of my life and realize that he will flee. Why? Because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'll share with you, I've begun playing basketball with my oldest daughter again. I, I think I shared that on Wednesday night. So I've been playing basketball up at the gym with my daughter. It's great. It's fun. Getting myself back in shape again. My legs kill. My back hurts, my neck hurts, but I'm feeling better. Um, so we were playing the other day, and I, some of y'all heard this story on Wednesday night, but we had some older boys walk in this week. And, and these boys were very confident. I was proud of them. They weren't like the other boys. They walked out there with confidence. You can tell they played basketball. They had their, their organization shirt on. I'd recognize the organization. Still high school kids. You know, but they had bigger in confidence. And um, so we won the first game, so we get to play these four. And the gentleman I was playing with, he's like, uh, Jerry, these, these guys are good. I said, it's all right. Should we keep your daughter on the team? I said, yes. If she goes, I go. So if you want me to play, she's playing also. So we're playing, and we walk out there, and they're trying to divide up who's going to guard who. Brother Baker, that's what you do when you play street ball, pick up ball. So um, we picked up a couple other, we're playing five on five, and um, this one kid tries to attack the basket, and no big deal, I block his shot. A few times later, he comes down, and I block his shot again. He's got confidence. He goes again, and somebody else comes and blocks his shot. This goes on and on, and you, you know me, I'm just trying to encourage the young, young guy. It, you know, I just tell him, you, you know, it, it may not be good to come down here again, bro. You may want to stay outside and take an outside shot. It, you know, I'm just trying to encourage you. shoot a three. I, you get more points if you shoot a three than a two. Just stay out there and shoot the ball. He tries to penetrate again, and um, I'm going to say we, we weren't kind at that moment, but he didn't make the shot. It got blocked, and something else happened. Um, and coming down the court, I said, man, just, just shoot the three. And he just looked at me and I said, oh, I figured it out. You can't shoot from the outside. You're now in trouble. Because you can't shoot outside and every time you come inside, it gets blocked or you get hammers. You're in a world of hurts. Now this guy's running his mouth at the whole start of the game, so it just became an objective for me to try to help him out, Jeff. <laughs> you, you know, it's just what happens when you step on a, on a court. And, you, you know, and then in the process, you know, I've screened him, set a pick on him a couple times, and he's like, man, you, you sent hard picks. I said, that ain't hard. He, people don't set picks like that. I said, well, that's how they set picks when I grew up. And I said, but I wouldn't blame it on me. I'd blame it on the guy that you're playing with. I, don't, I haven't heard him once call, hey, pick right, pick right, or pick left. They're just setting you up. I'm just the, the one you're running into, you know, working with this young guy. Then he starts changing his schedules, changing teams, changing who people are guarding. And um, the game's almost over. And he goes, I, I, I'm going to guard the girl. I said, you know, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> I mean, three other guys have already beaten him pretty good. And he's now wanting to guard Kate. And I said, what, what are you going to do if she beats you? You know, I mean, you at least have some thought of hope in you right now. Because I promise you, she'll beat you. He's like, no, nah, she, she won't have a chance. So I said, okay, let's go. And um, so we, we get going down the court, and um, I go and set a pick on him again, and Kate curls right off of it, takes it, and shoots a layup. And I said, man, you're in trouble now, bro, because now this girl's just beat you. He goes, no, you set the pit up on me. I said, but she's the one you're guarding. You've got to stay with her just giving him a hard time, and then Kate hits the winning three-pointer over top of him uh, in the game, and 
this young guy that's walking out there with all boldness is now walking off the court with his head down, discouraged and everything else. But I tell you this because, hear me, people develop a lot of boldness in life, but most of the boldness that people develop is in themselves. On the spiritual well-being, a lot of times we start developing boldness in ourselves. And I tell you this because, like this story I've just given you, I was this guy's enemy at this moment. Now, after the game was over, I tried to be friendly and help him build him up and encourage him again and everything else. Um, but we stand against our enemy at times and try to fight in our own know-how, our own experiences, our own knowledge, and old, our own strength. The boldness is not in ourselves. The boldness is who we dwell with. The boldness is who we're trusting in. The boldness is in Jesus Christ and what he desires to do within our lives, what he has the capability because we, we go from one day to the next, one season to the next, in one battle and then into the next battle of life. Why? Because the, the enemy, he's very steadfast. He, he continuously works against our lives, wanting to destroy our lives, but there has to be an assurance. There needs to be a boldness because I've spent time in the throne of grace and through humility I can resist the devil, the Bible says, and he would flee from me, that he will flee from my life. The immensity of the complexity of our tax, the task, this is the next one, of witnessing demands that we stay close to the source of spiritual power. Hear, hear me, I, I've got to have boldness because I've been in the presence of God to be the right witness that God has called for me to be. Catch this, Matthew chapter 9. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. I just want to give you a little in. When you start praying for workers in the harvest fields, the first one that's going to get sent is you. But that's good. That's good. You, you need boldness. You need boldness when you go out to be a witness. We should pray specifically that the leaders of the church, that they might be able to overcome Satan and have victories in their lives and their work. We need to pray for the pastors. We need to pray for the teachers. We need to pray for the missionaries. We need to pray for those that we've joined forces with, those that we're going out with, that we might have effectiveness and be in the witness, the light that God has purposed for us to be. We, we should also pray day to day for our world leaders who are responsible for making significant decisions that affect each one of us. We are to be persistent and bold in our prayers unto God. Believing in His working, believing in what God desires to do. I don't know about you, but I, I want to be an effective witness. I want to do right in telling others and encouraging others. I need Jesus. I need the, the help of God in my life. You see, as Christians, I believe we're to make much of the responsibility, yet the privilege of prayer, praying, calling on God. We pray all kinds of prayers, the Bible declares, on all different types of occasions. We should pray and the power of the Holy Spirit. We should pray for the saints, the Bible declares, asking God to give us all we need to stand against the work of Satan. And having done all, the Bible says, yet continue to stand, pray. You see, I believe when we stand firm, surely, surely we'll see God answer our prayers. Why? Because we're persevering in the faith, persevering in what's pure, persevering in what's holy, persevering in, in what's right. I believe when you're living there, there develops a boldness of prayer in your life, just like Jesus had. Praying and believing, praying with that assuredness, because I've been in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I conclude with this. I want more boldness in my prayer. I want more effectiveness in my prayer. But I don't want that built up in who I am. It's built up because I'm in the presence of God. Walking with God. 
as I draw us back and the musicians come back, that was the key to Jesus' boldness. He was always communing with his Father God, fellowshipping, getting away in the morning, getting away at noontime, getting away in the evening. You find him over and over again just fellowshipping with his Father God. Seeing, the, seeing God's will done over and over and over again in his life. The fruit of that, what it accomplished in his life. And it just built boldness, not, not in who Jesus was, but in who Jesus was through the working of the Father God in his life. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. The fruits, the fruit of seeing God's will accomplished. I want to be a person of prayer. A person of prayer. I want our church to be a church of prayer, trusting in God that when we pray for people, people are healed. When we pray for people, people are delivered. When we pray for people to be saved, that people are being saved. When we pray that we desire to be a light, that we are a light to those that we fellowship with, those that we come in contact with, that there's effectiveness because there's a boldness in approaching the throne of grace and confidence in what God desires to accomplish because I've learned to pray in the will of God. Amen.